Atheist Nomads, episode 395, The Church of Satan. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo-hahs. Please be advised. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin. And we're definitely going to have some news today, but we're going to start off with the Dustin off the degree right after this quick uh, announcement that I was on the Zacrilege podcast. So you can check that out. Got the link in the show notes to his podcast. Um, check it out. We caught up. I was on that show back on episode seven, and they're now on. He's now on uh, two forty two. So yeah, check it out, and uh, yeah, hopefully you'll enjoy that. Lauren might be joining me for the news, but we'll see. But for now, let's get into dusting off the degree. <laughs> So we've talked about the rise and development of Satan. We've talked about, you know, the Satan of the Bible. We've talked with Lucian Greaves from the Satanic Temple and covered a lot of news stories about the Satanic Temple. We've referenced the Satanic Panic. And I do want to do a Dustin After Degree series on more on Satan and Satanism. But before we can get into a lot of that... We need to get to what's the original Satanists, and that is the Church of Satan. And this will also tie in with a bigger series for Dustin Off the Degree that I'm planning on doing on the rise of these radical groups that are really threatening to destroy democracy. And I'm not saying that Satanists are a part of that problem, but the Satanic Panic in the 1980s definitely was. So this is going to be the kind of the early primer on this. The Church of Satan was formally established April 30, 1966 at the Black House in San Francisco, California by Anton LaVey. He was the high priest of the Church of Satan until his death in 1997, but it had already started before then, just not as a formal organization. It all began in the 1950s when he bought a Victorian house in the Richmond district of San Francisco and painted it black. Then he started holding Friday night lectures on the occult at his house. While working through these, it allowed him to work out his satanic philosophy and allowed him to put to use weird things that he'd studied over the years. He started doing witches workshops to teach women about seduction and manipulation through glamour and feminine wiles. And nobody knows how many people were actually in these early groups, but a lot of the estimates are probably around 20 people. Uh, then in the early 1960s, LeVay started a group called the Order of the Trapezoid, and then that gradually developed into the governing body of the Church of Satan. Uh, by the mid-1960s, LeVay published the Satanic Bible. In the mid-1960s, LeVay started writing, LeVay was writing stuff and disseminating it through the circle. The papers were being called the Rainbow Sheets, and it was a, and then the essays were gathered and presented as an introduction to Satanism, and then would be featured in the Book of Lucifer. There was also, around that time, a paper describing magic and how to use that for practice <laughs> and, and for ritual. After Anno Satanus, the first year of the Age of Satan, it was 1966, with the formal founding, LeVay continued performing you know, these, these weekly meetings at his house, uh, but they turned into weekly rituals. In February 1967, uh, LeVay performed the satanic marriage of Judith Chase and journalist John Raymond, and that got a lot of publicity. And he also performed the first ever recorded satanic baptism with his youngest daughter, Zena, which also got a lot of public attention. Celebrities joined the Church of Satan, including Sammy Davis Jr. and Jane Mansfield. The group spread, establishing grottos in Detroit, Michigan, Dayton, Ohio, and New York City. The Church of Satan then started showing up in books, magazines, newspapers, documentaries, movies, TV interviews, and getting a lot more attention. 
By 1972, LaVey stopped having rituals in his home. 1973, the Michigan, Ohio, and Florida groups split off to form their own group, which then disbanded the next year. After that, members in Kentucky and Indiana split off to form their own group as well, the Ordo Templi Satanus. And then by 1975, LaVey was done with the grottos. So he got rid of them and then brought them back and then got rid of them again. Then the satanic panic hit. We will cover most of the satanic panic later, but the actual satanic connection to it was media reports of criminal conspiracies within the Church of Satan. It ended up being enough reports of that that the FBI had to issue an official report saying there were no criminal conspiracies involving the satanic church. The, the Church of Satan. Zena, who had been the first person baptized in a satanic baptism, uh, by this point was high priestess of the Church of Satan and became the spokesperson. Uh, Anton, by that point, was not wanting to be in the media, and Zena was willing to do that. So she showed up on the Phil Donahue show, Nightline, Entertainment Tonight, The Late Show, Secrets and Mysteries, The Sally sally jesse raphael show and more and more and more and more she even did some interviews with uh televangelist bob larson other members also got involved with media tensions trying to refute these allegations of criminal activity fortunately that eventually died down uh, when levey died the church was turned over to blanche barton his partner uh and carla levey also worked with her to help keep that going. Then in, then Carla LeVay left the Church of Satan to create the first satanic church. In 2001, uh, Blanche handed it over to Peter H. Gilmore and Peggy Nadramia, who are the current high priests and high priestess, and they published The Black Flame, which is the official magazine of the Church of Satan, and they are still around. The reason why when you hear about Satanism now, it is the satanic temple, not the Church of Satan, is because the Satanic Temple does activism and tries to get in the news. The Church of Satan doesn't proselytize, doesn't do activism, and doesn't try to get in the news. They don't want to have attention. They want to be left alone. On the date of 666, that's June 6, 2006, uh, the Church of Satan had its first public ritual Satanic Mass in 40 years. And they did that at the Steve Allen Theater in the Center for Inquiry in Los Angeles, marking the 40th birthday of the Church of Satan. Uh, if you wanted to be a member of the Church of Satan, it costs $225, and you just have to fill out a registration statement and send off your money, and then you're a member for life. If you want to be considered an active member, you have to do a much more detailed application and actually be accepted as a member. Once you've reached, become an active member, um, you are in the first degree. You can then work your way up to the second degree, which is witch or warlock. You can then work your way up to the third degree, which is priestess or priest. And at that point, you're considered clergy and can do weddings and funerals and baptisms and the like. Then you can work your way up to magistra or magister which is the fourth degree but the highest level is the maga or magus which is the fifth degree but then of course there's also the council of nine which is above that and the high priest and high priestess one big difference between the modern satanic temple and the church of satan is the church of satan has you know it, it got its start with the occult there's a lot of magic in there they are it is an atheist movement they do not believe in in a literal satan or any god or gods they believe that anybody who believes in any supernatural beings uh is insane they but they do believe in magic as something that is real but not yet understood by science and that you can manipulate it to manipulate the world around you, to use it th for things like manipulating people or seducing people. The classes for witches to seduce, you know, use sedux seduction in the feminine wiles to manipulate people. When you get into that kind of stuff, it kind of makes sense that how that would create the satanic panic. You've got a group of people doing magic with witches 
seducing people and holding black masses. Yeah, it, it kind of makes sense how that, that got there. Um, the Satanic Temple rejects the Church of Satan as being autocratic and overly superstitious and not doing any useful activism. Um, the Church of Satan doesn't recognize the Satanic Temple, saying that it is they are pretenders and not true Satanists, that only the members of the Church of Satan are the true Satanists. Which is kind of funny when you're considering they don't actually believe in a Satan. Uh, they, they view it as Satan is the, the adversary and that the Church of Satan is the natural adversary to religion um, and to the church. Um, not that they believe in the same supernatural beings, but they believe they are the adversaries, therefore Church of Satan works. And the satanic ritual and imagery works for that, uh, that anti-religious uh, mindset. Um, one common criticism I've heard of the, the Church of Satan is that it is inherently hedonistic, um, which makes sense with the, the magic and wiles and seduction and whatnot, that there would be a lot of hedonism involved with it. Um, it's never been all that big of a movement. It, other than the satanic panic, it hasn't ever really gotten all that much attention. And, uh, but it is worth going into that, yes, the Church of Satan is a thing. It is not the Satanic Temple. That is a different thing. The Church of Satan has the Satanic Bible. The Satanic Temple does not. The Church of Satan had Anton LaVey. The Satanic Temple has Lucian Greaves. No one from the Church of Satan has ever been on this podcast. Several people from the Satanic Temple have. <laughs> So the, the next thing, next topic we're going to cover for Dustin off the degree, uh, hopefully next week, if not, it'll be probably be the week after, uh, will be the satanic panic of the 1980s. Uh, that is a very interesting topic. Um, I'm planning from there to see if I can get Lucian Greaves back on to talk about the satanic temple. <laughs> So in the opening, I said Lauren might be joining us for the news. And Hello! Here she is! At this point, I think I'm feeling better than you are. Yeah, I'm coming down with something, so hopefully I'll be okay. <laughs> and I still think it's allergies. Hopefully it just is that. It doesn't make it any easier, though, does it? Nope. No, not really. Yeah. All right, so let's get into the news. All right. During the impeachment trial, there was a bunch of religious stuff in that. Because that belongs there. Do you want to guess which side did most of that? Mm, probably, yeah, the Republican. Was it the actual Republicans or was it the defense? Actually, it was mostly the Democrats. Oh. Yep. So. We need to have a stern talk with them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So we'll, we'll start off with one of Trump's lawyers, um, Schoen. Um, he's an Orthodox Jew, David Schoen. Okay. Um, last week, I almost included a story and then decided to drop it. Because he had put in for getting the trial, not have it on Saturday, because he's an Orthodox Jew and couldn't work on the Sabbath. And so they did put it in on the schedule to have, they did accept that request from him and take Saturday off the schedule. And okay. then after talking over the team, they all decided, yeah, they can go on Saturday without him. So he put in a letter. Asking them to drop that. Okay. That's odd. Yeah. And then while he was, when he was, he was doing his, his parts of it during the trial, he didn't have anything on his head. Like yeah. The normal stuff that Jewish men have. He skipped all that. But every time he took a drink of water, he put his hand over the back of his head. To keep the... Every single time. Is it, is it just a habit? And... What, what he ended up saying was he didn't wear a kippah because he was afraid it might offend somebody. He might, I can see maybe uh, afraid that he'd be, that there would be prejudice against him. Well, if you, if you think about it, you're an Orthodox Jew fighting on behalf of Donald Trump to try to keep support from basically Nazis in the Senate. Yeah. So don't want to offend the Nazis. <laughs> you shouldn't have been there in the first place. It explains why the team was like, no, we don't need you. We'll, we'll just go on Saturday. And he's like, uh, yeah. actually, I still want to get paid. So never mind. But there is this thing that a lot of 
of uh, a lot of Jews, especially the Orthodox Jews, the, every time they're eating or drinking, they recite some blessing mentioning God, which means their head must be covered whenever saying God's name. Oh. So he didn't have anything on his head covering it, so he just used his hand for that. I can see that just becoming, yeah, a force of habit. Uh-huh. Now, if we want to talk about what religion getting brought into that, okay, he asked for the Sabbath off. As a former Adventist, that's something I fully understand. Yep. You believe it'd be wrong to be working that day, so you try to see if you can get some accommodation to not have to work that day. Okay, that's fine. He asked for that in advance and then withdrew it when it seemed like it wasn't going to be necessary. And then he tried to go as normal as possible, which, okay, if he felt like he needed to have his head covered, if if you feel like you can't offend people by being yourself, that sucks. He was on the wrong side for that. Yeah, he was definitely. But but also he got paid. And and also he didn't he didn't push that onto other people. He just decided, yeah, I'm not going to bother with that this time. And putting his head hand on the back of his head every time he took a drink of water. Okay, big whoop. That didn't involve anybody see, else. Yeah, I did see some uh, people commenting that it's so superstitious and silly, but um, whatever. But yeah, and, and I do want to say one reason why we are talking about this one enough is because or this much is because I. I think it's important to talk about, okay, normally this is what people think would be kind of the silly religious stuff. It didn't harm anybody. Right. It didn't offend anybody. It didn't, didn't involve anybody else. Okay, so what's next? <laughs> dot, dot, dot. I'm going to start saying ellipses. On Wednesday of last week, uh, the Democratic House managers were caught in the middle of the hallways uh, Huddling together for prayers. That pisses me right off. Uh Uh-huh. I have a lot of built-up rage about that. High school, man. Getting around in those little hallways (laughs) when the freaking youth group was doing prayers. Sometimes they purposefully made it so that they were taking up the entire hallway so that you couldn't pass. Yeah. So I had a baritone saxophone, which is basically a battling ram. Battering ram. So I, you know, I crushed right through them on a number of occasions. So but, that, uh, yeah, that, oh, that pisses me off. So that started with, and, and from your, your stories from high school, uh, Mormons and Catholics battling. Yeah. Well, this was started by Representative Madeline Dean of Pennsylvania, who told Jamie Raskin, who is one of the head people in the Free Thought Caucus, who does identify as a humanist and, and Jewish. Yeah. So she's talking to him about this this prayer that she'd learned from her uncle, who was a Catholic priest for 50 years. So after she shared that with him, they called the group together to huddle together for her to say, may God grant success to the work of our hands. Okay. She really have to waste everybody's time with that? Waste everybody's time and get the side that's done better with maintaining social distancing to huddle together in a hallway. (laughs) Yeah. I bet there was immediate regret with Raskin. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Oh God. What, how did I get dragged into this? Well, uh, there, okay. There's more. Yeah. Put a pin in that one. Uh, Eric Selwell, uh, referenced the Bible several times while talking about the police officers that defended the, the Capitol, noting that he comes from a law enforcement family and said, quote, in many law enforcement families, we pray for our loved ones. And we know the scripture of five, uh, Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. In the video, you will see how blessed we were on that hellish day. We had a peacekeeper like Officer Hodges pr- protecting our lives, our staff's lives, And the capital and the certification process. Okay. And, okay, so yes, that is pulling in religion, but could be a lot worse than that. Right, yeah. Uh, That's just people drawing from their life experiences to make a point. Um, He didn't, you know, call for everybody to pray or anything. No. Nope. So, but this is is the Democrats? This is the Democrats. Yeah. Um, They did not talk about the religion of the mob. I roll. With their prayers in the House and Senate chambers and crosses and all of the religious shouting and religious signs. I guess you could say it was the white elephant in the room. Yeah, 
so they were trying to out Jesus the mob to try to get win over as many of the white Christians on the Republican side that they could get. Well, fuck them. <laughs> Don't stoop so low. Yeah. Um, Trump's team didn't talk much about religious stuff in any of the things they were talking about. A little, it's not a little bit here oh, and there. Okay, so it is relevant, but um, they, they would probably want to distance themselves as much as possible from that. Except for when they were trying to defend one of Trump's tweets from that day. Oh, and it actually wasn't even an, a tweet from Trump. It was a retweet. And it refers to Calvary. You know, when you do this, we'll bring in the Calvary. Yeah. As in the crucifixion of Christ. What? Oh, that's not... Calvary. No, Calvary is guys on horses. The backup, the support. The different spelling of it. It has a misspelling... It's a fucktard. ...of bringing in the heavily armed troops. Yeah, okay. The Calvary, not Christ on Calvary. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. So then saying, quote, and this was from Schoen, the Jew on Trump's, Orthodox Jew on Trump's team. The tweeter promised to bring the Calvary, a public display of Christ's crucifixion, a central symbol of her Christian faith, with her to the president's speech, a symbol of faith, love, and peace. <laughs> Except for it was a typo. Yeah. And everybody knows it. But I guess that gives you um, deniability. Expect, except what it actually said was, the Calvary is coming, Mr. President. You can hear the trumpets in your head, can't you? I mean, you know what that means. Uh-huh. <laughs> God. Just because people don't know how to spell doesn't mean that that should be a, a free, free defense for his actions. Wait, and it actually isn't even a different spelling. It's a difference in capitalization and just trying to say, no, this isn't, this isn't the normal meaning of the word. This is this different meaning of the word. Yeah, well. It, it, it's basically, it depends on what the meaning of is is. Oh, right. Yeah. All over again. But instead of being about a blowjob, it's about an armed mob trying to take over the capital. Oh, how our lives have progressed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, there was a lot more. Uh, it was, you know, Raskin even, because I, I just say to put a, a, um, a pen in that one. Um, Jamie Raskin did say, quote, one line always stuck with me from the book of Exodus is both beautiful and haunting. Even as a kid, after I asked what the words meant. Thou shall not follow a multitude to do evil. Like a mob? Yeah. Okay. Now, honestly, that's the kind of pulling in a line from scripture that still has resonated with you through your adulthood that I can totally understand. Yeah. Uh, that's, yeah. Because if anybody had said something similar with their own religion, you're just, you're just solidifying your point of view. You're not mm -hmm. spreading a message. So yeah, I mean, most of this was ambiguous talk. It yeah, um, and since oh, and and then there was one after the vote was done. Swalwell was asked by MSNBC to explain why they didn't call witnesses, and his answer was, "We could have called God herself, and the Republicans weren't going to be willing to convict Trump." So we we're proud of the case we put forward. Noise, God. Herself. Oh yeah, that was ob that I like that. <laughs> yep. God could literally be sitting there and say, I saw him do it and he wouldn't they wouldn't convict because it was they yeah. well, because they explained they let him off on a technicality. Yep. So it doesn't matter whether you're guilty or not if when it comes to a technicality. Now bring on the criminal court. Yep. Because they've made it clear, Mitch McConnell made it clear that Trump is, can be tried in criminal courts for what he did while president. Everybody admitted that what he, he was guilty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Most admitted he was guilty. Cruz and Hawley didn't. Fuck those guys. But they're co-conspirators. Jesus. They can't, they can't admit he's guilty or else they'd be admitting they're guilty as well. I, I, I don't understand how the whole jury thing um, is just, it's, it's very mind boggling in this situation. But it's gone. It's passed. It is worth noting that with the 57-43 final vote, yes, that was 10 votes shy of a conviction. That is not the highest vote margin that a 
impeachment trial has ever had. Uh, Andrew Johnson, um, his impeachment failed by one vote. Oh, this was the most bipartisan impeachment vote trial vote ever which was part of the problem so andrew johnson oh his, wait no you meant bipartisan bipartisan okay, yes because yes. they got quite a few republicans to switch seven over. republicans voted with all 50 democrats um but andrew johnson's it was uh there were, weren't very many democrats in the senate at that point because it was right after the civil war um all but I think it was one or two Republicans voted to convict him, and that wasn't enough. If they'd all voted to convict him, he would have been convicted and out. Um, a couple said, no, this is just a political... You're just trying to get rid of him because you don't like him. Because they'd been, he'd been vetoing everything Congress passed, and Congress is overriding every single veto. And so they decided just to get rid of him. Yeah, you think our government is shit. And that failed. But, we, we, yeah. we have history, people. We have, we have histories. Bill Clinton... His was basically party line and failed. The last Trump impeachment trial was one Republican voting with the Democrats. Right. So it failed. This one was seven Republicans voting with the Democrats. That was big. Yeah. Absolutely big. And it will be, I think in history, the end result of that will be that impeachment's not really possible. Well, convicting... A president in the Senate is not really possible. Right. And that this was as close as it's come to a, a and realistic probably one. ever going to get. Yeah. Hopefully in the future we won't have such a, a, a loyalty issue within the parties. Mm-hmm. All right. Moving on. Mm. Cow. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the American Atheists being joined by Americans United for the Separation of Church and State are suing the Department of Education. Ooh, this they haven't been is... sued in a while. <laughs> well, they get sued all the time. They oh. haven't been sued by atheists specifically in a couple years. Yeah, it's been, it's been a little while. Yeah. Uh, so this is, is based on a last-minute Trump administration policy change that they are trying to get overturned, and this rule forces universities to fund religious student groups even if they discriminate against non-religious or lgbtq students oh that sucks um the interestingly prior to this there was no rule well yeah universities were doing it anyway some did some states had rules that didn't allow universities to have campus groups that discriminated against possible members um, other states didn't have those rules, but some universities had policies. Yeah. But not all did. But this was a policy that was going to protect that it was, across the board. It was going to, f it was basically saying the Fellowship of Christian Athletes can be anti-gay and must be funded by the school. Yeah, I thought that was the whole point of having, um, not giving funding to religious clubs and organizations. Yep. Because then you fall into this kind of crap. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, uh, so the, the lawsuit is just wanting to get this rule stricken. It's barely been in effect. Just get rid of it. But that doesn't solve the problem. No, we need stronger rules. We need to make sure that public universe, there's no such thing as a public university. Everybody pays for them. Uh, okay. So this is where it gets really tricky. Yes, there are public universities, even though they are, they are owned and at least in part know, funded yeah. by the state. They aren't particularly cheaper anymore than private universities in most states. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but they all get federal funding. If they can do Pell Grants and federal student loans, that is federal funding. That has so far only really been a stickler when it comes to sports. Title X. It always comes down to freaking sports when it's universities. You do realize that we're like trying to teach people stuff here, right? That's why my, my alma mater, Walla Walla, well, now Walla Walla University, had a official men's volleyball team that played almost exclusively club teams. Yeah. Because Washington State University does not have an official men's volleyball team. They have an official women's volleyball team. Yeah. And there's a men's 
volleyball club. Yeah. And if so, that ruling applies to private schools if they want to be able to have access to federal financial aid for their students, which if you don't accept that, you better have a really good endowment or everybody accepts that. (laughs) So there's clearly the ability to put strings on that and it wouldn't be particularly unreasonable to put something similar in effect that you can't discriminate. Now, this is where it would never actually work, putting in an actual rule that you can't discriminate if you get federal funding, because every Christian school wants the ability to discriminate. Yeah. And there's no way you'd be able to get enough senators to sign off on that. Yep. Yeah. They, they They all come from those universities. For the most part. So, yeah, you're going to stick stick with your alma mater. Right? Alma mater? Alma mater. Mata. Whatever. Mater? I do not have one, so I don't know. Yeah. It's... Yeah. But anyway, so... It's, it's, it's a lot more uh, clear-cut when it comes to um, primary and secondary schools. Yeah. Yeah, where you... Well, it used to be clear-cut until we got all these charter schools. Yeah, we, yeah, he, he's working programs. on it. He's working on it. We've got to, <laughs> but I'm going to be watching the uh, Department of Education very closely for the next year. Yeah. Um, and, and like our local uh, charter school has, despite all of the official public schools being closed, doing all distance learning, our little local charter school down the street has been. They reopened. December. Yeah. They've been open this whole time. Yep. Dirty, grubby little kids running around outside with only half of them wearing masks. Yeah. Yeah. Taxpayer funded. But they give special attention to my corgi, so (laughs) they love it when we go for walks. They they do do some social distancing, though. They play with uh, six-foot noodles Mm. and hula hoops. Oh, nice. Make sure everybody's spaced out evenly. Well, it's a small enough school that... It's so white. (laughs) (laughs) You know that if they had a COVID outbreak, the health district would shut them down. You'd think, but they haven't had one. Yeah. Uh, On Valentine's Day, February 14, um, Joe Biden signed an executive order reestablishing the White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. So that got reestablishing. Yes. Wasn't that George uh, W. Bush's? Yes. George W. Bush first created it. Barack Obama doubled down on it. Donald Trump ignored it and then reestablished it as the Faith and Opportunity Initiative when he put it under the control of Pentecostal megachurch pastor Paula White. Oh, God. (laughs) Paula White. But yeah. Faith and Opportunity Initiative. Right. Which didn't really do anything. No. Uh, Give it money. A little bit. Mm, A little bit. It it, it really didn't do much. Uh, It it was among the many things that Trump tried to uh, tear down. Um, Apparently, the office is being called within the Biden administration the partnerships office you know if it was the government trying to get churches to pony up for uh community service that'd be great but that's not what this is a lot of it actually is i don't know we'll see sounds to me like an excuse to fund to uh fund faith-based initiative community services Mm -hmm. with government federal government money yes I want the opposite of that. Yes. To play devil's advocate on something that i think is ridiculous and needs to be done away with oh That's what atheists live for. Our society is... Fractured? Much of the social safety net uh, is missing. Yeah. And has been left to churches. Preschools are mostly run by churches and other faith-based organizations. Yeah. Including the YMCA. Uh, Homeless care. Yep. Food. Which, (laughs) with homeless shelters, we run into that with homeless shelters in Boise where the city has lost court cases about its rules that require you to go to a church-run homeless shelter or jail. Yeah. Uh, hospitals. Yeah. Healthcare. Like, 
you look at huge swaths of society that is being run by these faith-based organizations, if you want to be able to shape the programs they're running for the community, you need to have a way of providing some incentive for that shaping. Yeah. God knows city governments can't afford to do it on their own. Nope. Now, I would love for us to rebuild our society in a way where faith-based community service isn't a necessary thing, but that would require a lot of work. You damn socialist. <laughs> That's what church is for. And yes, I am saying I would love to see the government run homeless shelters, not churches, and hospitals instead of churches. Preschools. Yep. Just bring preschools and charter schools and all of that back under the school district. Yeah. Someday, maybe. But until then, you got to work with what you, what you have. Okay. Fair enough. Devil. Sorry. Devil's advocate. Yeah. Um, I was having such a terrible day. I did not. I, I missed that story completely. Oh, that one was a couple days ago. That was Valentine's Day. Oh, yes, that was. <laughs> that was Valentine's Day. <laughs> I, I caught it. Day. I caught it bef- a few days before that. Oh. When it was still... They're talking about it. He was expected to uh, sign it, and he has now signed it. <laughs> okay. And fortunately, that article was updated with the date that he signed it. <laughs> you gotta love that. Uh, in Pennsylvania, State Senator Brian Sims has been one of the most, if not the most, openly gay and o- openly atheist person in an elected office in this country. All right. And he has decided to run. Uh, he is a, a state representative in Pennsylvania. Uh, he has been serving in his state Senate since 2012. Okay. And is now running for lieutenant governor. All right. Is this the one that came under fire for posting pictures with his boyfriend? That was earlier today. I th- I saw that somewhere. I don't know. Well, a gay man in America, if he has pictures of him with a boyfriend, yeah. it's going to come under fire, of course. Uh, during one 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 notable uh, speech he gave on in the Pennsylvania State Senate was uh, in 2016 when they were debating a uh, 20 week uh, abortion ban. He said, "Quote." Each of us put our hand on the Bible and swore to uphold the Constitution. We did not place our hands on the Constitution and swear to uphold the Bible. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> Noise. <laughs> uh, if everybody realized that, if only, uh-huh. I wouldn't be so pissed off about them swearing on the Bible. <laughs> yeah. But there are many, many, many people who are, are running our government who feel like when they swear on the Bible, that's who their loyalty belongs mm-hmm. to. All right. Well, we've got a blue law to talk about. What? I think the last one we covered was when Utah was last laxing up their alcohol laws. Yeah. I know we had one that we covered quite a few years ago when... Idaho allowed Sunday morning alcohol sales. Mm, Mimosas. And well, it was the liquor stores to sell alcohol on Sundays. Yeah. Restaurants were still able to before that. Still need your Prosecco. Um, But the uh, Escambia County, Florida is working on a very similar change in rules because Florida is one of those states where every county can do whatever the hell they want. Okay. Oh, God, that's that's fun. We live in one of those states. Yeah, it's a mess. Yeah. And uh, they, much like Idaho did before a few years ago, didn't allow alcohol sales, or at least liquor sales, um, on Sundays. Well, Sunday mornings. Bloody Mary. You could probably get a Bloody Mary in a restaurant or bar, but you can't buy it from a liquor store. But, oh, true. But you need the vodka. If you need one, a Bloody Mary on Sunday morning. You yes. need to have a Bloody Mary as part of your religion <laughs> Yep. to have a Bloody Mary or a mimosa on Sunday morning. Prosecco, you can get at a grocery store here, but um, you can't get vodka, so that, yeah. that works. Um, so the, 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 the current rule has been in place since uh, 1989, which seems awfully recent for a blue law to be put in place. Yeah, well... Uh, but it allows there's alcohol- a lot of weird, weird laws put in in it, the 80s. It allows alcohol to be sold from 6 a.m. to 2:30 a.m. except for Sunday. And the reason for that ordinance is to not distract people from going to church on Sunday morning. And they are meeting 
Well, by the time this episode actually gets out, we'll have already met that day. Uh, so that should be going away soon. And I can say from living in a state where the rules have been, well, are variable. Haphazard? Yeah. <laughs> like that, that most recent big change only applied to the state-run liquor stores. Right. Because we still have those. And the state-run liquor stores just didn't open until noon on Sunday, and now they can open at 9 or 10. Yeah. Uh, so if you forgot you needed to get vodka for Bloody Marys, you can go get vodka for your Bloody Marys. That's right. Mama needs her medicine. <laughs> um, but... In Idaho, if you go to the eastern side of the state, there are dry counties. Yeah. Uh, this was something I found very strange to discover because when I, you know, growing up in Oregon, I had, which they have loosened up on, on liquor, what I had, had seen in Oregon and Washington was always that the state owns liquor and the state is going to get their goddamn money. Yeah. <laughs> So they don't give that freedom to local jurisdictions. Yeah. And then I get to Idaho and it's like, yeah, the state wants their goddamn money unless you're a bunch of Mormons. They should be trying to take the money from the Mormons too. Yeah, they should. Um, alcoholism is a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, they're trying to ban marijuana while at the same time making it legal. So, yep. Well, not touching tobacco or alcohol. It's, oh God, it's just such a, it's such a mess. It's worse than trying to ban marijuana. They're trying to make it unconstitutional to even try to legalize marijuana. Or any other psychoactive drug. Yeah. Including medication. Potentially. Potentially. Depending yeah. on how poorly it ends up finally being written. Oh, you know, you know, these, these guys yeah. aren't the most literate. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we've talked previously about the Mormon Church's Ensign Peak Advisors. They're... Their uh, financial fund, investment, the, the church-owned investment fund. Oh, yeah. It, the, the, the initial reporting on the- I always think of it, the Mormon church's uh, basement day traders. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, their, their $100 billion stock portfolio. Yeah. Uh, that, that first started getting reported a couple years ago, uh, if even that long ago, with- um, leaks um it was going on a mormon leaks website and after some investigations that the government did based on those leaks it was figured out that oh yeah this is a financial institution financial institutions have to do filings with the u.s securities and exchange commission every year and so they have now started doing those filings which shows that over the year 2020, they, in one particular fund, their stock portfolio, part of it, made $6.2 billion, which left their stock fund at $44 billion total. Wow. Now, this isn't the total of their No, holdings. that's the 100, 100 billion, right? Uh, it was a hundred billion in 2019. It has now had two years to continue to grow. Uh, the, the, the rest of their, their portfolio is land and probably gold and who knows what else. Um, they gained $650 million off of Amazon without buying additional shares just from, from growth or at least not buying much. Uh, tip if there's a pandemic, yeah, invest in, uh, services such as Amazon. They had about a million dollars in Tesla stock at the start of 2020. They ended the year with $330 million. Nice. God, that's a lot of money. That's how Tesla Elon- Tesla hasn't even done anything. That's how Elon Musk went from being one of the richest people in the world to the richest. Yeah. Jumping from $20 billion to over $200 billion. Yeah. 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 So- That's so much money. Fake money. <laughs> Very clear. These are fake monies. Now, the thing that, that... Until somebody decides to try and sell out and destroy the economy, that's all fake money. Which is my big concern with the Mormons holding on to this much in stocks. Because you're, then you're dealing with an organization that not only believes that the world is coming to an end, but is betting on it. Yes. They are... And will cause it. They are literally betting on the world coming to an end, and f they believe that when 
things start to go bad, everything like stock markets are going to dry up. So you know their plan is when it starts getting bad enough, there's that certain point where you hit sell all. If they dumped $44 billion in stocks, that would crash the global economy. I have a firm believing that no business should have the ability to crash the global economy or even the national economy. And granted, that's a kind of a, a stupid thing to say, because if you crash the U.S. economy, you crash the global economy. That's the global economy. No, yeah, you'd end the world by thinking that the world is going to end. And that's stupid, terrifying. And that's why I don't think, uh, that's why it terrifies me when end of the world evangelicals are running the government, because you know they're not planning for 20 years in the future. No. It's all going to happen within their lifetime. And you know they're supporting Israel and trying to arm Israel to the teeth because they want a war in the Middle East. So freaking backwards. They want Armageddon to happen. Yeah. That's the only reason why white supremacist evangelicals back Israel. Certainly not a race issue. Nazis aren't fans of Jews, but they do want to see them die in Armageddon. Ugh. And so they will back Israel and attack anybody who doesn't. And claim that anybody who doesn't pack. Oh, man, it's... <sighs> but yeah, the Mormon church should not have sufficient power to tank the economy. And if you think it's kind of U.S.-centric to say that if you tank the U.S. economy, you tank the global economy, that's... If you tank the European economy, you're going to tank the global economy. Yeah. Uh, China nearly tanked the global economy. What was it two years ago? A year ago? Mm. Not long ago. <laughs> China had some, some they, they almost put the whole world in a recession. Um, that was shortly after the pandemic started. I shortly think. before. Oh. It was like, that was Oh, I do not remember that. Yeah, 2019, uh, the Chinese economy shrunk a little bit and. Uh, a little bit and it almost destroyed everything. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds about right. Yeah. And then Trump passed, got his uh, tax cut passed and everything rebounded. All according to plan. Yep. For an update on a story from December that I talked to, talked with Jason about, um, Lujain al Hathlul was, to, to recap her story, she was a, is a feminist activist in Saudi Arabia. Whoop, whoop. Uh, she was one of the leaders in the May 2018 driving protest. Oh, right, right. And then was arrested literally a couple of weeks before the women driving in Saudi Arabia ban was lifted. And rather than her being released, she kept getting passed around back and forth through courts until they all finally decided they didn't have jurisdiction, but the terrorism court did. The terrorism court convicted her. That's such bullshit. But she sued, right? And the judge decided to count her time served and forgive the rest. Yay! So she has been released. Okay, well, at least she's been released. And she is still appealing the conviction. Because that's still on her record. If that, that's just principle at that point. It's like, no, 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 you convicted me on something that was literally legal two weeks later. <laughs> just under, under a terrorism court. I hardly. Under Saudi counterterrorism law, protesting against the government is terrorism. Oh, God. I'm surprised the U.S. didn't throw that one in with the Patriot Act. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would have risked the whole thing being thrown out in court too easily. Yeah, well. And in Spain, the Federation of Jewish Communities in Spain has been calling on the hate crimes public prosecutor to take a look into some crazy Nazi stuff going on in Spain. Ah, oh, okay. Because um, a lot of that stuff has been thoroughly ignored. Yes. Um, Not in, just in the U.S. In particular, they are, are referencing a demonstration that was held in honor of División Azul, the Blue Division, which was a volunteer military unit sent by Spanish dictator Francisco Franco to help Adolf Hitler invade the Soviet Union. Ah. Uh. So Spain's old fascist dictator... Helping his patron invade the communists. Yeah. And they're still worshiping them as heroes in some places. They're marching along doing the Nazi salute. Yeah. That's, no, that's just straight up, that's just straight up Nazi. Yeah. What's the Spanish word for Nazi? 
probably it's Nazi. probably Nazi. Yeah. <laughs> it's always just they're yeah. all Nazis. That sucks. Yep. Well, hopefully they um they have a you know realization that that's a problem. Yep. Feedback. This is a good one. From Dude Man Deuce via Discord. And yes, you can find us on Discord at atheistnomads.com slash Discord, and that will take you to the invitation to join our Discord server. Um, he wrote, this is the only atheist podcast that I could find that is not obnoxiously pro-Democrat. Keep up the good work. Sweet. We're not obnoxiously pro-Democrat. Yes. That's the key. And, and I had a little bit of back and forth um, with Dude Man Deuce about about that because we we do have a like I, I my editorial policy on it is that to cover a story it needs to be related to atheism humanism or skepticism in some way most of the skepticism stuff has fallen aside because there's too much of import in the other two arenas and there is a lot of bad stuff trump has done that i have ignored because there isn't an obvious human rights or church state separation issue. Right. We bitch about that at the dinner table. We, yeah. We're not going to talk about it here necessarily. Because right. there's plenty of actually church state separation issues or, or human rights violations worthy of covering. Um, you don't need to talk about just the pure political stuff. There are political podcasts to talk about that. Um, I know for a lot of atheist podcasts, they took the final merging of evangelicalism and the and the Republican Party to basically make politics an atheist issue. And I don't necessarily begrudge any podcasts that have done that. I've just chosen to keep on topic. Um, you and, decided to not include that as a topic. Well, in fact, it was something that that in 2017 we talked about quite a bit on does it even make sense to keep doing the show when there are so many so much worse stuff getting done and the answer was you, we still need to do it because somebody still needs to be looking at the stuff that that this stuff still matters even if it's not the most important it still really matters and needs to be talked about yeah and so we have kept on that that path um and i i s- firmly hope that at some point in the future, we will have two viable parties that support church-state separation and basic human rights. I would love for that to be the case. Yeah. That's just not the world we're in right now. Yeah. <laughs> and from Gloria in Oregon, <laughs> it is spelled O-R-Y-G-U-N. Okay. So intentionally doing the mispronunciation of Oregon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, via YouTube, what's with so much laughing when nothing funny has been said? Too much rambling about nada. Try writing a script for parts of the show. I only lasted about six minutes in, so maybe it got better later on. I love that. That is, there are so many troll tells here that um, it's not worth like really getting upset about because you know the person's, well, you don't complain about a show when you've only listened to six minutes of it because that's the beginning of the show. Mm-hmm. That's usually rehashing your day or a topic. Um, And then the mispronunciation of Oregon. Yeah, it's just like, whatever. Now, there there is... I thought it was kind of funny, though. Us laughing at nothing. We post the podcast on on YouTube because it's easy to do, and one person has asked us to continue to do it. So I've continued to do it. Um, And, and that one person was a listener who that is her preferred place to get the show. So I've I've kept doing that. Um, podcasts are not generally compatible with YouTube. YouTube is visual content, not primarily audio content. Right. Static images don't work great on YouTube, and most YouTube videos are 5 to 15 minutes. And in a 5 to 15 minute video, you keep on topic or people click away. An hour-long show doesn't really do well there. And... I did listen to the first six minutes after reading this comment. I laughed five times, maybe six, in six minutes. Only two... You're maniacal. ...were full laughs. (laughs) Where I laughed at two jokes that Lauren made. 
that I thought were funny. Because I'm hilarious. I don't cl- care if, if Gloria didn't find those funny, but I thought they were funny. You're married to me. You better think they were funny. And I was kind of doing a nervous chuckle mid-word, like almost as a part of speech at a couple points, because I was nervous talking about something that personal. Oh, yeah, which is understandable, which is also a terrible way to start a podcast and why you don't listen to the first six minutes. <laughs> yeah. Not not saying editorially is the Right. No, no, no. Yes. Way, no, no. But, oh, um, no. It, it is not considered best show to start with something that bad or, or something to start that week. But this was a case where I wanted to open a little more vulnerable. And apparently Gloria th- thinks that vulnerability should be scripted. Yep, that's all right. <laughs> Crawl back into her Oregon <laughs> basement. You know it's a 13-year-old boy, but that's my assumption anyway. Well, if you want to contact us, you can use the contact form at atheistnomads.com slash contact, or you can email us feedback at atheistnomads.com. The contact email will still be working for a while, but I will be sending it to spam eventually. Or not spam, but trash, because it's mostly spam. So use feedback at atheistnomads.com, or yeah, just use the form. Um, Join the the Discord channel at atheistnomads.com slash Discord. And if you want to support the show, you can find out how at atheistnomads.com slash donate. Lauren, thank you. Thank you. And until next week, remember... Not all those who wander are lost. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find show notes and contact information at atheistnomads.com. Follow us on Twitter at Atheist Nomads. And like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash atheistnomads. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcatcher of choice. And while you're there, feel free to leave us a review. Theme music is courtesy of Sturdy Fred. Until next time, this has been The Atheist Nomads.